when you do that, when you enter into those times where you willingly surrender the almost things or the halfway things or all that because you want something else, you know what happens? You become dangerous. And that's the language we use around here, sometimes in the pulpit and in the foundations class, that we want to be a dangerous church. But we're not going to become dangerous unless we're willing and able and ready to let go of the almost things and embrace the things that God has called us to, the deeper things that you can't gain without renunciation. And the only way to get there is down this path of prayer and fasting. Jesus said it himself, so will you take him seriously? Hey, as Pastor Jordan mentioned, we are in a new series, uh, Jesus, and it's broken up into three chunks. And I'm excited to be kicking it off this morning, this little chunk called Be With Jesus. Uh, as we get ready to dive into the message, I want to encourage you, if you have your Bible or if you have uh, your Bible app and you can open it without resistance or with, uh, you know, out looking at anything else on your phone, uh, please do that. And go ahead and turn or open or click or whatever you need to do to Matthew chapter 17. So Matthew is one of the four Gospels. It is the first book uh, of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so Matthew 17 is where we're going to be spending the majority of our time today. And I just wanted to get you there uh, in advance. So... Um, have you ever had a time in your life where you had like something, what you thought, and it was genuinely really great happen? Uh, it was exciting. It was, you maybe felt like it was even somewhat life changing and you were just like, you know, lifted up on cloud nine, whatever, all that stuff. And then like really quick after that happened or you learned that news or, or whatever, however it took place, not long after something really not good like happened, something like different happened or something related to that kind of sucked the life or uh, took the wind out of your sails or just kind of deflated you. You'd been up here and then you had this other news and you were like, oh man, and you almost forgot about how good that stuff had been. You know, I, I thought about this this week. For me, one of those moments was um, my junior year of high school. Uh, I had long flowing brown hair uh, down to about here. Uh, and so every, every year, uh, at the beginning of the year, it was really important in high school. You, if you didn't have a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend at the time, you had to really quickly figure out, like, who were you going to ask to homecoming? It was kind of like a feeding frenzy. And so, like, <laughs> uh, so anyway, somebody, did you say my name? <laughs> oh, God, oh, gosh. Okay. I was like, you said, oh, Josh. I'm like, man, I haven't even started preaching yet, Laura. Just give me a second. So, <laughs> first, so, uh, so anyway, um, and so you had to really like decide because homecoming was like pretty early on in the football season and, uh, you know, you had to make plans and figure out all this stuff and like, you know, you had to figure out and a lot of homecoming who you were going to ask was going to be dependent upon who you had class with, you know, because that's who you're going to see the most. That's who you maybe you're going to build a relationship with to be able to be comfortable to ask them to homecoming. So I remember this anticipation because I didn't have a girlfriend at the beginning of my junior year, and I was like, all right, I got I to gotta be on this, okay? I got to be on my game. It's a big deal, junior year, got to step it up. And so going through my classes, I had a, a Spanish class, and there was this girl in the Spanish class that was like, oh, man, okay, she might be the one, you know? And, and so I started kind of like slowly, like, you know, like, hey, how's it going? Because I didn't know her before that. And then I started kind of like walking a little bit with her after class and then like all the way to her locker. And then finally, and I felt like she was just like, I was like, I, I think she's out of my league, but she's like letting me do this. And so like, I'm going to just go for it and see what happens. Like if I land this, it'll be, it'll be huge. It'll be huge. And so I finally was like, hey, would you, would you, uh, Think about going with me to homecoming, and her face, you know, big smile, kind of got a little bit, like, embarrassed, and she's like, yes, I, I will. And I was like, I mean, you, I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather, right? I was just like, I can't believe I, I pulled this off. Like, this is amazing. And so, you know, she was excited, and I was excited, so we started talking about plans, and of course, I wanted to go over and, and meet her parents. Uh, so when I did that, went over and met her parents, uh, after a football game on a Friday night, and uh, had, I mean, the conversation was fine, everything was good. Until then, they said, Hey, we're really, uh, you know, excited for you guys to go to homecoming, but we just want you to know that uh, she has to be home by 10 p.m. And I was like, 10, 10 o'clock. I was like, the, the actual dance doesn't start till nine. <laughs> I was like, what, what, are we, what are we supposed to do? Like, that's, every, all of our friends, everybody's going to be hanging out, like, all night. That's what you do for homecoming, right? I was like, 
10 o'clock. Like, and it was just like, you could have, I mean, it was the complete opposite. All of a sudden I was like, it went from, this is going to be the greatest night ever to like, this is going to stink. Uh, there's a whole lot more to that story that I won't go into today. But, you know, uh, on a much more significant level, Jesus had experiences like this. Uh, one of the biggest ones we see in the Gospels is his baptism. He's baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and it's this incredible moment where uh, the Father's voice, heaven opens up, we're told. The Father's voice, his Father speaks this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This beautiful moment of power and affirmation and identity. And it says that the Holy Spirit descended in the form of the dove and actually rested on Jesus. This incredibly symbolic thing that relates all the way back to the Old Testament and Noah's Ark and all this stuff. And it's just this high point moment in his life. And then if you read the following verses, it says that immediately after he was baptized, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he was there and he prayed and fasted for 40 days. And he had nothing to eat uh, and nothing to drink during that time. So you think about this moment, this apex moment, and then all of a sudden it's literally almost immediately followed up by one of, an awful, d very difficult time in his life. And he had another one of these, and that's what we're going to look at today as we kind of intro this series and this particular sermon on prayer and fasting. Jesus, as you know, had 12 that were very much in his inner circle, 12 disciples. But if you read the Gospels, you'll also come to realize that within that 12, he had an even tighter inner circle that was three. And those three got to see things uh, that the other nine did not. So he had the 12, but then he had the three, and he would take the three Right, with him to see things, uh, that was Peter, James, and John, by the way, to see things that the others didn't get to see. So he entrusted them with very special things. One of the things that he entrusted them with is what we find in Matthew 17. That he invites Peter and James and John to come with him up on top of the mountain. He leaves the other nine at the foot of the mountain with a lot of the people that have been following him and following his ministry and hearing his teachings and seeing the miracles that he'd done and were curious about him and wanted to know more. And he goes up on to this mountain and he begins to pray. And while he's praying on the mountaintop, so it's literally the mountaintop experience, part of where we get that term from. He's literally on the mountaintop. It says that, the, again, heaven is opened up and the glory of the Lord shines on Jesus and it says that he's transfigured. So we call this the Mount of Transfiguration. To, be, uh, to, to say that he was transfigured, if you read the text, it basically says that he became just from like a, a normal in appearance, like you or I, to all of a sudden he was bright white and sort of and glowing. It was the glory, the Shekinah glory of God was just alighting on him, was landing on him, and he was just transfigured in his presence. And so the Peter, James, and John are witnessing this. And then it says that Moses and Elijah show up, right? So the God, the heaven is open and the Shekinah glory and the presence of the Father and God. Now you have Moses who represents the law and you have Elijah who represents the prophets in the Old Testament. And Jesus said what? That he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets, right? He was the combination of the two. So you have both of them showing up and it's just this incredible, powerful, powerful moment. And then it's over. Like all great things like that are, they can't last forever this side of heaven. And so Jesus eventually has to come down both the literal and metaphorical mountain. And when he does, he finds something interesting, kind of a bummer. And that's what we're going to look at today in Matthew 17, verses 14 through 20. I gave that all as context. I just think it's important even though it has not a lot to do with the thrust of the message, it's important to understand the context of it so you can put yourself in the story. So it says, when they came to the crowd, this is verse 14 again, so they're coming down the mountain, literally, and here's this crowd. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He often has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Just real quick, I want you to think about this. 
He's suffering greatly. He has seizures. He often falls into the fire or into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, you know, those guys that you'd sent out to heal and that have done all this other good stuff and that have seen many miracles and all that you've empowered and all this stuff, and, and they were unable to heal him. Well, what did that look like? Think about that for a second. They were unable to do so means they were attempting to do so. They were trying, right? They were doing what they had seen, what they had been taught. They were trying to figure out how to heal this boy, and they were unable to. So think about the scene that's going on in this situation, it's just whatever they're doing, it's just not working. And so this is what the man says to Jesus. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus responds, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? This is Jesus, meek and mild. Gentle Jesus, the lamb, right? You unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Remember, Jesus just had this apex, mountaintop experience. Now he comes down and it's this frustration. Can you even, just in his humanity, can you sense the frustration in his voice here? Like, bring the boy to me. Like, just bring him over here. Jesus says, rebuked the demon. So he identifies it as what it was, which is a demon which is why I was trying to throw the boy into the fire or into the water. I was trying to take him out. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. All right, let me give you just a tiny bit of literary analysis regarding Matthew's gospel. Now, what I want you to note is that Matthew has very intentionally divided his gospel into three parts. If you read it and you really get a, a big picture of you, you realize how meticulous Matthew was, how much attention to detail there is. He takes a length of time with the genealogy, right, which most of us just automatically skip over. But for Matthew, it was absolutely essential that he established Jesus' bloodline and all these things. So Matthew, this isn't haphazard. This isn't, we think about sometimes, all oh, those, it was 2,000 years ago. They're not as smart as we were today. They didn't understand how to organize things or tell stories or all this like we do. No, this guy knew what he was doing. And so he divided his gospel very intentionally into three parts. Part one, and I have these on the screen for you, in case you're taking notes or want to take a picture. Part one is he talks about the miraculous conception and the birth of Jesus. He spends the first portion of his gospel on that. That's Mary and Joseph and the manger and all the stuff we just celebrated a few weeks ago. The miraculous conception and the birth. And then from there, he moves into a significant chunk that, that really it's the big middle part of his gospel is Jesus' Galilean ministry. Right? This is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I mean, it's, it's a big chunk. The core of Jesus' teaching, not just the Sermon on the Mount, obviously, but many other things. And he tells stories of where Jesus went and did signs and wonders and miracles, and there were healings, and there's all of this stuff. And it's kind of rapid fire. It's moving from one thing to another. So the miraculous conception, the birth, then the ministry. And then there's a shift towards the end of his gospel, part three. Jesus prepares for the end. This is when Jesus stops talking about a kingdom. And he starts talking about his death and predicting his death. And what that would accomplish and the importance of it and the reasons for it. And Jesus begins to prepare his disciples to advance the kingdom when he's no longer present with them in body. So he understands that his time is near. He understands he's not going to be here for forever. And he understands that God has given him these disciples to further the gospel, to further the kingdom. And so he starts to hand off responsibility. And he starts to prepare them for that emotionally, mentally, mentally, in all the ways that he could. Of course, they didn't really receive it all that well and didn't deal with it that well. But he did his best to get them ready. So it's basically saying, hey... 
You know, I'm the boss now, but I'm not going to be the boss here shortly. When I'm not the boss anymore, you're going to need to do this, and you're going to need to do this and these things. And here's how I want you to act, and make sure you remember all these things. So it's, again, it's like somebody getting, getting their affairs in order when they know that their passing is imminent. So part one, part two, and part three. And I mentioned that, mentioned that because the story I read to you from Matthew 17, which is near the end, may seem out of place, especially if you read it in its context. Matthew puts it right in the middle of part three. But wouldn't you, and I, same here, but wouldn't you think that it would belong more so in part two? It's a story about Jesus' ministry. He heals this boy, drives out a demon. So the question is, why did Matthew do that? Well, we have to ask ourselves if he didn't put it in part two, he put it in part three. There's a reason it seems to us like it's about his ministry, but if it's in part three, maybe this story isn't about the healing. And if it's not about the healing, which it sure seems like it would be, but if it's not, what is it about? I'll give you the answer. This is a story about discipleship to Jesus and what it means to share in his mission. This is a story about discipleship to Jesus and about what it means to share in his mission. Why couldn't we cast it out? The disciples asked him in private. The answer is hidden in such a minor detail that more often than not, it's completely overlooked. And why it's overlooked is somewhat understandable given the reason. So look at your scripture, your Bible, your phone app. In most translations of Matthew 17, so if you have the NIV, for example, the, one of the most common ones, the one that I use more often than not, if you have that translation, scroll down and you'll notice that there is no verse 21. You'll notice that it simply skips from verse 20 to verse 22. So I don't know how many, what translation you're using, but in most of them it should skip from 20 to 22. When you're like, that's odd and I've never noticed that before. Right? How many of you have a translation that does not have a verse 21, just by a show of hands, who are actually looking? Yeah, so, yeah, a lot, right? The reason for that is because some of the recovered manuscripts of, this, of Matthew's gospel include verse 21, and some don't. In fact, some of the earlier ones don't. Some of the later ones do, and so there's been debate among scholars as to whether verse 21 should be included or not. If you don't have it in your translation, maybe there's a little like asterisk or a footnote or something that indicates that you should look down below in the notes of your Bible, and then it'll say verse 21 is not in the earliest manuscripts, uh, such and such, that they chose to, to leave it out in some translations. In most modern translations, they just add it as a footnote. But here's what's interesting. Mark's gospel, which was written before Matthew's, and which we know for a fact that Matthew borrowed from, actually includes verse 21 in the original copy of the same story. Okay, now I don't need you to go there. I'm not even having it on the screen. But Mark 9:29, which is the same story, same account, all that stuff going together, says, Jesus replied, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. This kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. So when we read the story, but we miss the, this piece of it, we don't fully understand it. We, we don't think of it as a discipleship story. But that's what it is. Jesus is giving instructions. When he leaves, you're not going to have me to drive out every demon, to heal every sickness. And so this kind, which if you know anything about the Gospels, you understand there are stronger demons. So this kind, this, this strong one, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. So because Mark wrote his Gospel before Matthew and he includes this, it's very reasonable to think that we should add that verse 21 as, in as a part of our normal reading into Matthew's text. And it changes the story when Jesus says, you know, why couldn't we drive it out? Because we, you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. When you add that in there, it changes it quite a bit. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who's a famous British preacher, scholar, theologian, man of prayer, called Mark 29, and its parallel text, Matthew 17, 21, 
the key verse for unlocking revival across the Western world. The key verse for unlocking revival across the Western world. This kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. A man who was as learned as anybody from a scholarly theological standpoint said, this is the key verse, this one right here, that even much, much, many of your translations don't even include. This is the key for unlocking revival across the Western world. Why is that? Well, let's talk about that here in this last 20 minutes. Thomas Kelly in his book, A Testament of Devotion, says this, and I have it on the screen for you. In the Old Testament, no one could could stand before God and live. If you understand the Old Testament, the presence and the power of God was so strong, it it terrified people, and you couldn't stand before it uh, if you were unholy. you, you, You were in trouble. In the Old Testament, no one could stand before God and live. And then, after the resurrection, so after the, the Lord is risen, and the veil in the temple is torn and the glory pours forth. After that, the same thing is true. Only it's the outer man, the false self that dies. The false self, excuse me, in the presence of God falls to its knees and cannot live. And we're not talking about false self in the progressive Christianity sort of woke terminology. What we're talking about is the self apart from Christ the self that has not been conformed to Christ, all the things that we do to armor up or try to contrive certain images of ourselves that are separate from Jesus, all of those things, right? All the shows that we put on, all the facades we build around us, all those things, those things, the false self, those things apart from Christ, those can't stand in the presence of God. Those can't live any longer. Those things must bow. They must come down to their knees They must get out in the presence and the power and the glory of God when we encounter him in that way. Brennan Manning, one of my spiritual heroes, recounts a story about when he took a 20-day silent retreat at a cabin in Colorado. Some of you are like, I like the cabin, I like the Colorado, I like the 20 days, I don't like the silent part. Silence, 20 days in silence. Nothing to distract himself with, nothing to look forward to, totally alone and present before God for 20 days. At this point, what's interesting to note is that he was 18 years into his calling as a Franciscan priest. He's a sought-after speaker, a best-selling, renowned author, and he, an accomplished professional Christian, confesses during this retreat that he can't help but notice this wide gap between all of his intellectual theory and his actual lived experience. These are the words from his own journal from that retreat. He says this, and it's on the screen again. The great divorce between my head and my heart had endured throughout my ministry. For 18 years, I proclaimed the good news of God's passionate, unconditional love, utterly convicted in my head but not feeling it in my heart. I never felt loved. Vernon Manning always believed in the love of God. He studied it, he illustrated it, he wrote about it, he spoke about it, he counseled people toward it. But then, stripped of all his distractions, all his activity, all his busyness, all of his doing, with nothing to dress himself up, nothing to cover him, so to speak. That's where he finally discovered and when he finally knew the love of God. Here's a profound truth for this morning. It's really important in this 21 days of prayer and fasting that we're in to help you frame things. Is this, in the place of prayer, belief becomes knowledge. In the place of prayer, belief becomes knowledge. There's so many offshoots of this that I'm tempted to go into. Um, I'm fasting from offshoots, though, so I won't do those. But um, it's not actually true. Uh, But in the place of prayer, belief becomes knowledge. So often we think of prayer primarily as petitionary. It's when we come to God and we have our list, and I'll talk about this some here in a few minutes, but we, we let it, you know, give him our list, and then we're like, oh, all right, we're out. 
right? And that's just not what prayer is for the most part. It's really not what it is. In the place of prayer, belief becomes knowledge. Prayer is meant for us to experience intimacy with God. It's a place where we allow him to know us. And I know that sounds weird because you're like, well, he already does know us. And I agree, but there is still a permission piece that's important. And it's hard to explain. I don't have time this morning, but there's still a piece that's important that when you come before God and you allow yourself, like Brendan Manning did, to be stripped bare of all your illusions, of your false self, of all your constructions, and all the things you've contrived, and all the stuff you've set up, and you've said, Lord, here I am. I don't want to hold on to anything of that. I, want, I, I just want you to see me. It's allowing yourself to be known, and that allowing yourself to be known implies a deep level of trust, doesn't it? Because how many of you are just ready to like let somebody random know your deepest, darkest secrets or thoughts or desires or all these things? No, you don't do that, right? You don't reveal that to anybody because you don't trust them yet. Some of us, that takes us a lifetime because of wounds we've experienced. Some of us, that's even hard to do in a marriage situation because of wounds we experienced. And I understand that. You just don't reveal that. But when you're able to come before God and say, like, here I am and lay it all bare, you're revealing to him that you trust him that you can trust him to take that and that you're not going to have like a lightning bolt strike you or something, right? But we have some of, some of that image in our head. But when you do that, when you do that, and this is just my experience, okay? So I will talk about this some again a little bit later, but my experience is that the way that he reciprocates is so powerful and so beautiful. And you actually begin to not just intellectually understand that he loves you, but you actually feel his love. That the, when you lay yourself out there and you can just receive from him, he wants to just pour. And there's no words need to be spoken, right? Have you ever had times in your life where maybe you've been away from somebody for a long time and you miss them desperately and you're reunited in some way and the first thing you do when you see them is just you guys hug and you hold on to that hug for what seems like forever and it's just this, you're just squeezing the air out of each other, you know? And neither one of you want to let go. Do any words need to be spoken in that moment? Isn't there just an understanding of the level of intimacy and friendship and depth and all that exists between that that's going on? And this is where what I am talking about when I say in the place of prayer, belief becomes knowledge. The idea of going into the, the quiet place, to the, the secret place, is to experience God. It's not just to petition. And this is so important for our fast. And what I, what I thought of this morning, this was not in my notes, this was something I thought of as I was just kind of going through them. And I, I feel like it was the Holy Spirit. And if it's not, I'll let Jordan tell me that later. But like, I think that I felt like we're two weeks into this fast and it got off to a weird start because of not having church last Sunday and all that. But I really feel like some of you, and I, I totally understand why you've done this, but you've chosen things in your fast and, and you're giving those up and that's good. But, but I think maybe after today, you want to reevaluate what you've given up. Because it's a good thing not to eat certain foods, and that's a good thing. But, I, but I, I'm wondering, at least for some of you, and just some of you, I'm wondering if what you need to give up isn't noise and distraction. Because it's easy to be like, I'm not going to, it's not easy, but you see what I'm saying? It's to give up food and all those things, but you can still have the TV on and the radio on and still doing social, and all these things, and you're not, put yourself in a position to experience and encounter God. And it's okay to change things. But maybe whatever it takes just to be for 10 minutes, if you can do 10 minutes of silence, do 10 minutes. If you can do an hour, do an hour. But something where you're just letting God see you and you're asking him to reveal himself. Frederick Buechner says, for what we need to know, of course, is not just that God exists, not just that beyond the steely brightness of the stars, there is a cosmic intelligence of some kind that keeps the whole show going. A lot of people can believe in that. But we need to know that there is a God right here in the thick of our day-to-day -day lives who may not be writing messages about himself in the stars, but in one way or another has tried to get messages through our blindness as we move around down here knee-deep in the fragrant muck and misery and marvel of the world. I love that. You know, it, it's not objective proof of God's existence that we want to take for granted that most of you already have that. <laughs> You believe that God exists. It's not objective proof of his existence that we want. But what we want, if we could really just get down in there, what we want is the experience of God's presence. 
right? That's the miracle we're, we're really after. And, and that's what I think we also get when we engage with him in prayer and we just lay ourselves bare. We allow him to speak to us, to encounter us. It's not enough to really uh, believe in the love of God. We have to allow God to love us exactly as we are, naked and unashamed. And the way that we allow that love in, the, the way that you allow that love in is in prayer. As straightforward as I can put it, it's in prayer. And that's the invitation of prayer, is making your requests known to God a part of it. It absolutely is. Jesus invites us to do that. And we should do that. But the invitation of, of prayer is to lay ourselves bare in some way and allow him to love us and hug us. And that's not in some like weird, touchy-feely, like new age kind of sense. It's like, no, the reckless, raging fury they call the love of God. That when you encounter it, the false self can't stand. And all of a sudden, all the things you thought you wanted to hide, you don't want to hide anymore. And all the things that you thought that you wanted to hold on to, you willingly let go because you can't imagine right, something better than what you're experiencing. And then when you do go to make your petitions before him, you'll notice over time that they change a lot. Because he's beginning to shape your heart and shape your desires as you encounter him in new and powerful ways. That's the invitation of prayer. That's, on so many levels, what this 21 days of prayer and fasting is about. It's not just giving something up. Giving something up is fine. I mean, that's good. That's a part of it. That's the nature of it. But it's what are you replacing it with? As you give up X, what are you filling it with? And what you're supposed to fill it with during the time of prayer and fasting is the presence of God. That's the invitation of prayer. We believe in the love of the Father, but prayer is the experience of that love. We believe in the friendship of Jesus. Prayer is the experience of that friendship. We believe in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, but prayer is the experience of that power. And it's the yada. You've heard us talk about that a lot before, the Hebrew word yada. It's the relational kind of experiential knowledge. It means to know somebody on a deep, intimate level that goes well beyond intellectual assent right? Or it's, it's not, it's way deeper than knowing facts about a person. It's actually knowing someone in ways that you can't even fully always explain or articulate because the relationship is so deep. It doesn't always happen, right, in the moment of prayer. Some of you are sitting there like, well, wait a second, I've prayed and never had any of these experiences. I'm not saying that every single time you go in there, like, the heavens are going to tear open, the Shekinah glory comes down and you start like, I'm glowing white. This is, Josh was right. This is amazing, right? In fact, most of the time, prayer feels pretty normal, whatever normal means. Prayer feels pretty normal, but then it infuses what it does if you stick with it. You go after it and you allow yourself to do the things I've been talking about. What it does, even if it feels normal, it infuses your otherwise ordinary life with the miracle of God's presence, and you become acutely aware of God in situations where you never would have otherwise. You begin to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you in situations where you never had before. You begin to feel the presence of Jesus with you in situations where you otherwise wouldn't have noticed because now your ears have been opened and your eyes have been opened and your sight and your hearing are different than they were ever before and they've been shaped. And Brennan Manning, again, he's getting some airtime today. He says this, what if the hour you spend in the prayer room is when you refocus on Jesus so you can carry his presence with you into the other 23 hours of the day? With a heightened awareness that he is with you, this is what I was just talking about, that he is with you, that he is for you. And here's a big one, that he likes you. Not just that he loves you in some kind of abstract, otherworldly kind of way, but that he actually likes you that he's proud of you, that he delights in you, that he hears your thoughts. You start to pray in real time. You instinct, so prayer no longer becomes just the thing that you set aside time for, but it's a constant communion and conversation with God. You start to pray in real time. You instinctively lift situations to the Lord in the actual moment you experience them. While you're watching that distressing news reporter hearing about your friend's latest crisis, you're no longer, I love this, 
I love this. You're no longer deferring all your prayers to some later, holier moment because your whole life is becoming that holier moment. Man, that's so good. I wish I would have said that, written it. Prayer is not a business meeting, you know, where you let God in on the items of your agenda and then sort out an adequate timeline, right? Let me read that again. Prayer is not a business meeting where you let God in on the items of your agenda and then sort out an adequate timeline. It is the space you make so that the blinding light of his unbreakable love can shine into every crack until the fragile false self is shattered. Marshall McLuhan said this, everyone I know who ceases to believe begins by ceasing to pray. And there are, Jordan and I have had many conversations about this over the last several months. There's 10 sermons in that statement alone. Everyone I know who ceases to believe begins by ceasing to pray. See, there's this pattern in church history. And I'm gonna flip that around here as we move forward. Every great move of God can be traced back to a few humble people with their heads bowed. We study revival history, global revival. Prayer movements always precede revival movements. Prayer movements always precede revival movements. And that's because in the place of prayer, God heals us of our insecurity our broken thought patterns, our hidden sin, our stubborn cynicism. In the intimacy of prayer, God peels away the imprisonment of our false self and reveals our belovedness. Why is that important? Why is it important, right? If prayer movements always precede revival movements, why is that important? Why does it work that way? Well, I just said in the place of prayer, these things happen. And now here's why. It hinges on this. Because it's only when, and this isn't on the screen, but just listen, listen close if you would. It's only when we come to terms with our own belovedness. It's only when we come to terms and grasp the reality and the deep yada truth that God loves us and that he actually likes us. It's only when we do that that we can actually see the belovedness in others and then draw it to the surface. And that's what revival looks like, right? Right? That's what revival looks like. That's why revival always starts with prayer. It all comes down to love, to really knowing the things, knowing the things that up until that point, you'd spent so much time only believing. All right. But Jesus didn't stop at prayer. Just a couple of minutes left here, I think. Jesus didn't stop at prayer. He said prayer and fasting, and so many of us wish he wouldn't have said it. Right? So, I mean, just like, man, it's like, you know, I just wish I could just order Grubhub tonight and be good. Fasting, what, what, good, what good is that going to do? What good is fasting going to do? It's an honest question. It's an honest question. And it's an honest question, not because, like, you don't know what you're talking about, but because a lot of times with the church, the people up here, me, Pastor Jordan, whoever, we haven't talked about it enough. So, like, we call you to a fast. We don't necessarily explain, though, what, what it's about. And uh, we try to do a really good job of that here. And I think we've done a pretty good job of it. But it's understandable to ask the question, like, well, what does it matter? If you grew up, uh, you know, Lutheran or Methodist or Catholic and, and you gave up something for Lent, you know, it was just like, oh, I'm giving up chocolate for Lent. All right. Everybody else is doing it, but there was no like, there was no like, and then what do you add in? Like, what's the benefit of that? Right? So I get it. I get why, why it's hard. So let's just talk about fasting. What, what good is that going to do? Fasting is not only, and I spoke to this earlier, fasting is not only about self-denial for the sake of clarity. So we do that because we're, we want to clear our heads and be more sensitive to the spirit. And it's a big part of it, but also, and maybe more than anything, Fasting is about spiritual authority. Think about that story I told earlier after Jesus' baptism. He's led immediately into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and for 40 days, he, he had nothing. Well, you know uh, what came after that? 
It says that he left the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit and went about doing many signs and wonders and miracles and healings and driving out demons and preaching the gospel and people were receiving it. So it's a big deal. Fasting, maybe more than anything, is about spiritual authority. Back in verse 17 of Matthew 17, which I asked you to have, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. I mean, come on, Jesus. I mean, don't you think that's a bit much? I mean, you know, lay off of them, all right? You know, I mean, they're, hey, they're new at this. I mean, they're, they were, they're giving it the, their old college try, you know? I mean, they're, they're trying. Can you just, oh, guys, that's okay. Oh, you know, come here, guys. I'm sorry that you couldn't do that. I'm sorry that it's been a little embarrassing that you've been trying to cast this thing. Guy, oh, I love you. Just rubs their head, you know, like that kind of thing. You unbelieving and perverse generation. And then they ask later, hey, why couldn't we cast that out? And again, oh, you just, you got to get it. You haven't practiced enough, and you didn't say, yeah, just, it's okay. Just say a few Hail Marys, and you'll be good, and like, just get it. No, right? He replied, he replied, because you have so little faith. Yikes. Yikes. I mean, let's just think about that for a second, oh, just real quick. Imagine if, you know, you, you make an appointment, right, with Pastor Jordan to talk about something. And you're like, hey, I've been struggling with this issue, and I just, I really want to get your wisdom and input. So what do you think's going on here? And Pastor Jordan's like, it's just because you have so little faith. <laughs> do you think you'd come back to New Point Church? <sighs> right? It's, it's, that's intense. So try to put yourself in their shoes. So what, here's what's interesting about this. In the English, little faith, the term he uses here, is the Greek word, and I think I have this on the screen, oligopistia, okay? Oligopistia. Now, here's why it's interesting, because you won't find that word anywhere else in all of the Bible. This is the one and only time when this word is used. And what's interesting, again, about it is this term actually doesn't refer to a total lack of faith. It refers to a person who's, this is, I better stop here. Listen to this. It refers to a person whose beliefs are, aren't expressed in a way that distinguishes them from the common life of the unbeliever. The way that he actually would have said it would have been like, you little faiths. Like it was a, an identifying thing, you little faiths. Like, like you call your kids, you little snots, right? It's like, you little faiths, right? Does anybody say little snots anymore? I don't know where that came from, but anyway... Some people, Laura again says yes, she does. So we know. So, little, you little faiths, right? It's referring to a person whose beliefs aren't expressed in a way that makes them any different than an unbeliever. So they say, oh, I think X, Y, and Z, but their life is exactly like person over here who thinks A, B, and C. It's the exact same. Here's and this may be one of the biggest things you could meditate on from today's message. This is on the screen for you. What he's talking about, it's a passive kind of faith that means a different worldview, but a common life. And guys, I could spend a while on this. It's a passive kind of faith that means a different worldview, but a common life. And during 21 days of prayer and fasting, what we all have to do, a big part of this is, is we all have to take a look and ask ourselves, is this what's going on in me, right? Right? Do I have a, a different worldview? Maybe I think that I, you should vote this way or that this is not right or this is. Do I have a different worldview? But my life is common. My life is no different than those who have a different worldview. We all have to do that, right? Josh and Carrie Goodman, Jordan and Lindsay Lombard, all of, our, all of our board, all of our elders, we all have to. It's not just you guys. It's us. We have to look and go, man. I know we believe a certain way, but what's the outflow of those beliefs into our lives? Are we little faiths? Are we? I don't, and I, you, have, you have to ask yourself, it's a scary question sometimes. I'd rather not ask it of myself, but like, you're like, yeah, but I've got to. Because I don't want a common life. I don't think we, any of us do. Why couldn't we drive it out? Because your beliefs aren't distinguishing you from anybody else. 
You're trying to exercise authority, but you've neglected the means to grow in that authority. It's like you signed up for a marathon, but you know the only training you did was you ran half a mile two days before it. How well you think that's going to go? C.S. Lewis says this, our desires are not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Part of what this fast is about is depriving yourself of something. It's removing, right, something so that you can create a different kind of hunger in you. It's dealing with and tolerating physical hunger so that it can expand and intensify your spiritual hunger. It's to refine your desires. You see, we spend our lives making tiny little exchange Exchanges, none of them are a big deal on their own, but they all add up. Shopping to cure my boredom. Alcohol to trigger rest from responsibility. Entertainment and distraction from my every idle moment so I don't have to actually think about anything. These are simple pleasures, but they can dull our taste buds until all we crave is the mud pie. Dr. Vincent Felitti says this, it's hard to give up something that almost works. It's hard to give up something that almost works. So maybe the challenge for you this morning is what is it that you've been doing that almost works? Maybe that's something you weren't willing to give up for the fast. And I don't say this again with any kind of condemnation, but maybe again, as I sensed earlier, maybe it's time for you to switch starting today what you've given up. Maybe it's trying to give up those almost things, those other half loves. In fasting, you surrender the almost things. You can control to receive the promised things you can't control. And the promised things are infinitely better, but they can only be received. They can't be controlled. And I understand it can feel like a terrifying journey to get there because the joy of fasting usually feels like misery of starving at first. And that's why fasting, although it can end in joy, it has to begin with renunciation. Renunciation is actually the word that the ancient Christians used for this self-inflicted kind of starving, specifically starving of an appetite that isn't delivering on its perceived promises. Tim, if you wouldn't mind just coming up real quick in just a couple more minutes. I mean, we didn't have church for like forever, so I feel like we can go a few minutes over, right? Ronald Rollheiser says this regarding renunciation. Every choice is a thousand renunciations. The decision to commit to one romantic relationship is the decision to say no to a thousand other romantic possibilities. The decision to commit to one career path is a no to a thousand other hypothetical career paths. And I love this. And the decision to saying yes to kids is a saying no to essentially the remainder of your life from that point. <laughs> and then he gets back to the more intense stuff. He says this, we want to be a saint, but we also want to feel every sensation experienced by sinners. We want to be innocent and pure, but we also want to be experienced and taste all of life. We want to serve the poor and have a simple lifestyle, but we also want the comforts of the rich. We want to have the depth afforded by solitude, but we also don't want to miss out on anything. We want to pray, but we also want to watch television, read, talk to friends, and go out. And he concludes by saying this, and I kind of separate it for emphasis. He says this, much of the modern Christian life is an attempt to reconstruct Christianity without renunciation. And the unexpected casualty of that is our spiritual authority. Why couldn't we cast it out? Why is our church making no impact? And I'm not saying our church, I'm just saying the question, why aren't I seeing the things in my life that I want to see? 
Maybe there hasn't been enough renunciation, enough letting go of the almost things. Because what's happened is when you don't do that, you sacrifice your spiritual authority. Once you get far enough along in a fast, it should no longer be about losing something for spiritual reasons. It should be about gaining something that I wasn't willing to go on living without. I'm going to say that again. Once you get far enough along in a fast, it should no longer be about losing something for spiritual reasons. It should be about gaining something that I wasn't willing to go on living without. Most of the times in my life when I feel like the Lord's called me to a fast, it had nothing to do, literally nothing to do with what he was calling me to give up. That was just a side effect because that's by definition what fasting is. The reason I felt he was calling me to enter into a fast was because there was something I wanted so badly, so deeply, that so went beyond what the world had to offer, that transcends just our normal everyday lives, that I knew through the Holy Spirit that the only way I was going to make any inroads or movement in that direction was through renunciation. So yeah, I was getting rid of whatever it might have been, if it was food or if it was social media type stuff, whatever it was, I was getting rid of that, but that literally had nothing to do with it. The whole reason I was fasting was not for removal, it was for addition, right? It was unto something. So what is your something right now? What is the something that you're fasting for during this 21 days? We've got two weeks left, and if you miss the start of it because we missed church and all that, I totally get it. You know what? Start today and finish these last two weeks with us or add another week at the end. When you do that, when you enter into those times where you willingly surrender the almost things or the halfway things or all that because you want something else, you know what happens? You become dangerous. And that's the language we use around here sometimes in the pulpit and in the foundations class that we want to be a dangerous church. But we're not going to become dangerous unless we're willing and able and ready to let go of the almost things and embrace the things that God has called us to, the deeper things that you can't gain without renunciation. And the only way to get there is down this path of prayer and fasting. Jesus said it himself, so will you take him seriously? Will you take him seriously? How do you go after this stuff? You starve your almost things, your cheap substitutes, all those things that you use to escape as a means to cope, but you know they don't produce any joy because you have to keep doing them over and over again. prayer and fasting. Would you stand with me? Prayer and fasting. Those are the humble hidden ways that we choose the things of God over the things of this world. As Tim just begins to play, I just want you to think real quick. Just think as I was speaking, you know, what is this fast unto for you? What are you going after? What are the things that you're, what are your deep desires? Yeah, I know you may be physically hungry right now, but my question is not so much about that. My question is, are you spiritually hungry? Is there something that you want more than food or media or whatever it is you've given up? What is that? Here's what I want to do. In just a second, I'm going to close in prayer. Those of you who want, you can be dismissed. Totally, totally fine. I know there's kids to get and we're a little over and all that. I get it. But if you're here this morning, and this is something that kind of Mike and Dina spoke to when they were here, and you're like, man, I'm just hungry. Like, I don't even necessarily even know what it's for, but I just, I'm just hungry. I just want the more. I just want, I, I, don't, I know I'm giving something up, but I want to be filled up. That's what I want right now. I'm going to ask Pastor Jordan, if he, he'll, he'll be over here. Matt, if you would just wouldn't mind being over off to this side here, and then I'll be in the center. These are obviously two pastors, and Matt's an elder and a board member. The three of us, if you want to come down and just have us pray over you, I want you to stick around and do that just for hunger. That's what you're coming down for this morning, okay? Uh, I know there are other things we could pray for, and, and happy to do that at other times, but today this is just that you have this burning desire in you for more. And if you Don't feel like you need to come forward, but you just want to hang out and just pray. This is 21 days of prayer and fasting. So you can pray for maybe a few minutes more and just sort of be in the presence of God. So again, if you are just hungry and you want more, 
come down front and receive prayer. If there are longer lines, I'll find some other people that can help pray too. If you need to go get your kids, that's fine, or you can just hang out, any of those things. So let me just pray. Jesus, we don't just want to give up stuff and, and, and think about or talk about how hard it is to give things up. We want to let go of all of that because that's not what this has to do with. This has to do with more of you, more understanding of your love for us, meeting us in the secret place, the place of intimacy, the place where we are known and we know you. We want that first and foremost. So I pray for people right now in this room that they would just be transformed by your radical love, that they would encounter during this next two weeks, even this morning, your love in a way they never knew that would burn away all their insecurities all the things they are experiencing, shame and condemnation about, those would just go in Jesus' name. They would be replaced with radical love. And I pray for those who are experiencing hunger, that they would be filled. Those who you promise us, that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. So I pray for those that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for holiness, for a life that isn't common for a life that doesn't just like look just like their neighbors. Pray for those people that you would fill them up to overflowing in this next two weeks, that it would transform not only their lives, but the life of this church as well. Jesus, it's all about you. Holy Spirit, come now as we pray, as we just rest in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.